Friends, good afternoon to everybody. And thank you for being here to listen to this story. I take off from where the earlier panel left the discussion on where we are all going and what are the skills that are relevant today. It was a very interesting discussion and I felt very happy to have been a part of it, to have been here to listen to it. Now, how does an organization survive for 230 years? That is the story of the College of Engineering, Gindi. It begins as the survey school, the oldest technical institution in the entire country. It started in 1794. We are now in 2023. If an institution like this has survived all these years, it clearly means it changed with time. It did not remain the way it was so many years ago. Certainly, it is not teaching the same subjects that were taught in 1794. And that itself, I would say, speaks volumes of how an institution remains relevant in the times or in the changing times. Of course, being an educational institution, it will reflect changes a little late. It always happens that industry or thinking is a little ahead and then it comes to the institution and then it goes further. But a college that started in 1794 has a fascinating history. And I was greatly privileged to get a copy of the history of the College of Engineering Gindi that was written by the 1966 batch, which was published in 1991 by Ramakrishnan, Babai, and one more uh, former student of the college. I went through that, but that was not my only source for the information, and then I went on to do a lot of research, and I was able to pick up some very fascinating snippets about this college, which I feel privileged to share with you today. We can start with the presentation. So this is your landmark building that you have in Gindi, but the story begins not in Gindi, but it starts in Nungambakam. And it be before that, I must also tell you that when the English began to start a survey school, the first documents have a very clear writing about how Indians are very bad in engineering. In 2023 or 2022, I don't think they would be so foolish enough to write these kind of stupid notes. The idea was that they were teaching the natives about engineering. They forgot that we have structures like this, which have stood for more than 1,000 years. And then structures like that with the construction of a dome which they thought is beyond the possibility of any Indian and it had to come only from Rome. And so they had an idea that the natives were a bunch of illiterate people who had to be educated and uplifted. So this was, it was begun with a very colonial motive. There is no doubt about that. But the first engineers, engineers within inverted commas, because Indians did not use this term. For us, it would have been a Maistri, or it would have been a Kotanar, or a Sital, or whoever it was who was doing construction. But when they came, the first engineers were part of the British Army. And they were also the first architects, so to speak. All the buildings that were built in the 17th century and the 18th century by the East India Company, they were built by army garrison engineers. And when they built, they built to ensure that any building will withstand a cannonball falling on it or a battle is fought around it. So when you go to Fort St. George, you will find that every building has got a thickness of four feet. Every wall is four feet in thickness, 48 inches. That was the kind of, uh, how shall I put it, over-designing that they were doing in order to ensure that they were taking care of the requirements at that point of time. The British began to conquer, and this is a classic example of an army-built building, the oldest church built by the British east of the Suez Canal, which is in Madras inside the, church of, inside the fort of St. George. And there you have the church of St. Mary. The walls are all four feet thick. The roof curves downward so that when a cannonball falls on it, it won't stay there, but it will roll and come down. So this was the necessity for such a design. This was the kind of engineering that was practiced by the army engineers at that time. At that time, in the 1700s, particularly from 1750 onwards, 
என்ன பண்ணாங்கன்னா முல்லா எப்படி இந்த ஏரியாலாம் அபகரிக்கலாம் அப்படின்னு சொல்லி தே பிகேன் டு காங்கர் த ஏரியாஸ் அண்ட் இட் வாஸ் நாட் அவுட் ஆஃப் வார் தட் தே வர் காங்கரிங் இட் வாஸ் எசென்ஷியலி அவுட் ஆஃப் ட்ரெச்சரி அண்ட் ஃப்ராட் தட் தே வர் ஏபிள் டு காங்கர் அண்ட் வி வர் ஸ்டூபிட் வி வர் ஏபிள் டு பாஸ் ஆன் வாட் எவர் வி ஹேட் டு தெம் கிராஜுவலி தே ஃபவுண்ட் தட் தே ஹேட் அ ஹியூஜ் டெரிட்டரி ஆஃப் லேண்ட் விச் தே ஹேட் டு அட்மினிஸ்டர் அண்ட் த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் திங் யூ டூ வென் யூ அக்வயர் லேண்ட் இஸ் யூ டூ அ சர்வே Surveying is the first thing that even today when we go and buy a property, what do we do? EC irka, no encumbrance certificate. That's the first thing. Then patta. Adh pakat le enna laam property irka. So this is the first thing that is done. So surveying became very important. Now the English were not capable of doing surveys in this hot weather. Imagine going out in summer in May and June and July, going around in the fields and finding out which part ends where and which part begins there, etc., etc. They needed Indians. so that is when the first demand for surveyors really started and survey school became necessary so that you could train the natives in order to be able to do a survey appo kuda the noting is very clear it says the indians are incapable of thinking by themselves they have to be told what to do so they are very good in tasks where they will be told you go and measure this then you go and measure that then you go and measure this then you come back and tell me and you doc such notions existed among the people then and so a survey school was supposed to be started colin mckenzie whose portrait you see on that side he became the first surveyor general of india and he was the man who needed surveyors and at that time you had michael topping who was the astronomer of the east india company he was the guy with the telescope who was looking at all the stars and finding out their positions around the madras sky he operated from nungambakkam in a place that came to be known as the nakshatra bangla it is it was on college road today you have the nungambakkam weather reporting observatory or the meteorological office you have it over there that was called the nakshatra bangla because it had a dome and it had a telescope which you will see shortly now this was the measuring instruments that were inside the nakshatra bangla where they were able to make measurements of the sky and the positionings of the stars and things like that and this was the building in nungambakkam which survived till the 1930s and the 1940s so this was the place where the observatory stood and michael topping was here as the astronomer royal and the chief observer observer of madras and in 1794 the survey school begins over here with a set of students now they were all at this point of time either anglo indians or they were orphaned english children english children whose parents had died and who were ta- being taken care of in madras by the east india company's funding these were the people who became the first students of the survey school they were not indians were not admitted at that point of time the first batch had a set of 12 students who came to join this place and there they learned how to survey now in 1802 you had what was called the great trigonometric survey of india what is this trigonometric survey of india for the first time india was measured with heights point of elevations point of depressions slopes sea coast everything was going to be measured and that exercise was going to start from madras and the man who was leading it was william lambton Lambton would have a theodolite with him and he would have surveyors who would go along with him chains and theodolites and he would start from college road from there he measured the height of st thomas's mount went to st thomas's mount started from there and that is how the great trigonometric survey of india began and the man who worked with him was an alumnus of the survey school joshua depending today we have a company called depending and depending in madras they are one of the best known intellectual property rights legal firm they trace their ancestry to this joshua depending who worked with william lambton and they first from here they went all the way up to tanjavur they measured the height of the big temple then they mounted the theodolite on top of the big temple from where it fell down and broke into several pieces damaging a part of the big temple also and then they had to wait for 2 years for the new theodolite to come from london after that they continued lambton died in nagpur and from there it was taken over by a man who would go all the way up to the himalayas and he would survey the height of mount everest 
and he was George Everest and he gave it his own name. They said, what is the name of the mountain? Take it from me. If you look at this world, all the MGR, Anna, Kalengir, Amma, they all have their own name. And they said, what is the name of Everest? So from then on, it became Mount Everest. And it remains this way. That survey begins here. And one of the surveyors came from this survey school, which is the College of Engineering, Gindi today. Then you had a man called, he came here, de Havilland. Today, you know, how many of you have seen Mount Road? I'm sure you all know Mount Road, Anna Saleh. Where does Anna Saleh start from? Anna statue. And then it goes all the way up to St. Thomas's Mount, correct? Now that route was given by Thomas Fiat de Havilland. Havilland was the man who was also another engineer who belonged to the British Army. And he left behind some very interesting buildings in this city. The most famous one being St. Andrew's Kirk. St. Andrew's Kirk, which is in Egmore. He built the St. George's Cathedral. He also built the St. Andrew's Kirk. The reason why I bring up St. Andrew's Kirk is that the St. Andrew's Kirk is just by the river Kuwam. And the soil there is very soft. The requirement for the construction of this was that there should be a dome in the middle supported by several columns. Now, every time they attempted to construct a dome, the soil being soft, the weight of the columns was sinking. And he didn't know what to do about it. He then decided to consult the students of the survey school and some of them said that we have men who dig wells in Madras. They make terracotta wells. What they do, they bring a ring of terracotta they beat it into the ground, then they remove all the soil in the middle, then they beat the ring further down, remove all the soil in the middle and they keep doing it till they reach the base, the hard rock. After that, nothing can dislodge this particular structure. And that is how the entire St. Andrew's Kirk was built. It was built on a foundation of terracotta wells. And de Havilland writes in his book that it is entirely because of the artificers of Madras. Now the artificers, as we know, surveyors and artificers came from the survey school because by the time, maintenance of water bodies was very, very important. You needed to, so you started from a time when survey was required. Suddenly you now find that maintenance of water bodies is required. So water body, na ipo enna pannu mo modalla and arathla or building akatti or colony panni adu or area ava mat area le endi area ava matidu. அந்த காலத்தில் எப்படின்னா அந்த வாட்டர் பாடியை மெயின்டைன் பண்ணிட்டு வந்துட்டு இருந்தாங்க இது நல்லா இருக்கணும் அப்படி இருந்தால் தானே தண்ணி வரும் அப்படிங்கிறதுனால ஸோ த ஃபர்ஸ்ட் ரிக்குவயர்மெண்ட் வாஸ் யூ நீடட் சம்படி டு மெயின்டைன் வாட்டர் பாடிஸ் ஸோ யூ ஹேட் த கவர்மெண்ட் ஸ்டார்டட் அ டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் கால்ட் த டேங்க் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் விச் டுடே வி நோ எஸ் தி பிடபிள்யூடி த பப்ளிக் ஒர்க்ஸ் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் இட் ஸ்டார்ட்ஸ் இன் தி ஏர்லி எயிட்டீன் ஹண்ட்ரட்ஸ் எஸ் த டேங்க் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் அண்ட் இன் தட் டேங்க் டிபார்ட்மெண்ட் தி பிகேன் டு எம்ப்ளாய் தி students of the survey school. So, how do you see relevance? First, the surveyor. Then suddenly you find that there are hydraulic engineers. You don't call them engineers at that time. You are calling them artificers. So, they are now taking care of the various tanks and bunds all over India, South India particularly. And they are going around, they are doing surveys. They are taking care of the walls, the condition of the water body and all that. That's because of the students that came from here. Now, gradually, the requirement begins that you should have various courses so you have an engine you have an upper subordinate course and a lower subordinate course the upper subordinate course was meant only for the europeans the overseers and all that lower subordinate course was meant for the indians who would go do the surveying and the maintenance of the tanks and things like this is how the departments got divided so from initially one department now you have two departments Gradually, the number of gradu people passing out of this survey school is becoming 25, 40, etc., etc. And they now require a building of their own. This Nakshatra Bangla is all fine, but it cannot accommodate so many students, multiple courses. At that time, you have the Chepok Palace of the Nawab of Arcot. The Nawab of Arcot was chased out of Chepok Palace by the East India Company by sheer fraud. And they acquired the palace from him. And after that, they did not know what to do with the palace because it was the most impressive building in the whole city. They didn't want the most impressive building to look impressive. So they decided that we will now use it for public works department. We will use it as an engineering college and things like that. So these students were asked to come to the Khalsa Kalas Mahal, 
of the College of Engineering, at this time not yet the College of Engineering, but still the survey school. And then, slowly, the students begin to join this place. Finally, in the 1860s, you have the, in 1857, you have the founding of the University of Madras, and then this becomes recognized as the College of Civil Engineering. It, begin, it upgrades its degree to a Bachelor of Civil Engineering degree, and the students begin to operate from the Kalas Mahal, which is Chepok Palace, just next to the Chepok Stadium. It is still standing there. The building is still there where the engineering college was at one point of time. At this time, in 1879, you have a very interesting personality of whom not one photograph survives. Lieutenant Colonel Henry Davison Love. Henry Davison Love becomes the principal of the College of Engineering in 1879. And whenever he would go on leave to London, somebody else will officiate for him, then he will come back and take over. Which is why when you go to your dean's office and you find his name there, you find broken uh, track record, this year to this year, then again this year to this year, then again this year to this year. So Love effectively was principal of the college between 1879 and 1907. So he was here almost for 28 years, he was responsible for the well-being of the college. And after he retired in 1907, he wrote this book, which is called The Vestiges of Old Madras, a four-volume book on the history of the city. And till today, it is the finest history ever written by anybody on Chennai. Nobody has been able to beat this. It's a four-volume book. So one volume, two volume, third volume. The fourth volume is an index to volume one, two, and three. That is the level of detail to which this man has gone. So I used to manage for years with a free for download copy from the internet. Last year, I mean this year in July I was in London and I went to a second hand bookshop and my wife told me, don't buy any books. In the waste manga there. She went off shopping somewhere. When I go in, the first thing and the naal volumes smiling at me from one cupboard. So I go to that man and say, What is the price? Then he gave me a price where I fell immediately in shock. You know how things are in London, right? Everything is so expensive. But I couldn't resist it. Finally, I paid and I bought all the four volumes and this is the cover of one of those volumes. My wife was told much later. She said, Putti enna ore ganakar de abdi enna apdi ganakum. You cannot do anything about it. So, and so love remained the principle. Now love, this house was where love lived and this is in Victoria Hostel Road in Tiruvallikeni even now, behind the Chepok College, Chepok uh, campus. And uh, this is where he wrote Vestiges of Old Madras. This is where he was principal of the engineering college. Now, the main reason why you are all here in Gindi is because of love. Now, next to Chepok Palace, next to the Chidambaram Stadium, what do you have? Madras Cricket Club, correct? This cricket club used to be virtually the owner of that entire Chidambaram stadium at that point of time. Now, Love began to eye that property. And he said, my students need a cricket ground, they need a tennis ground, they have to have a better facility. These Englishmen, he was also an Englishman, but he said, these colonial sahibs are playing once in a week, whereas these students are needing it every day. So, you, I have to take over this property. That is when the government finally woke up and said, you know, whatever it is, cricket cannot be sacrificed. Engineering can, it can go, it can become whatever it wants. Cricket cannot be sacrificed. So in 1908, just when Love was retiring, they made a move saying, we'll have to shift this college to Saidapet, where there is enough and more land which can be given to this college and they can take it over and they can run it in whatever they, way they want to. So 1908 is when the talks really begin. Now, at this time, there is a very interesting paper of 1865, which gives you some of the early publications of the College of Engineering. It says, Madras Engineering College. The first book is 1000 Conversational Sentences in Roman Tamil, specially adapted to the use of persons employed on public works to which are added 30 selected stories from the Katha Manjari in the same character, arranged by P.S. Rajagopala Mudaliyar, Tamil Munshi in Civil Engineering College. Now, what is Munshi? He's a translator. Muripayar Padar. 
because there are the English professors, the professors cannot speak in the language of the Indian students, Indian students don't know. So, Kelvi Keta Elar Quietar Kanga, students Allah. What is the question? I want student to answer. I want students to ask a question. Everybody is quiet. So you need a munshi to do the translation at this point of time. So there is actually a handbook. And later, when the Englishmen from this college go and work in the PWD, they will use that book and say, ah, what do I say next? So, that kind of thing. So this was the kind of book that was being used. A short grammar of the Telugu language, because at that time, remember that Andhra also was part of this. So everything was working over there. You had earthwork, how to set out slopes for excavations and embankments. Calculation of the equalization of cuttings and embankments with hints on execution of this work, etc., etc. Anglo-Tamil primer, students of the civil engine, then hydraulic. So you can imagine language was the first requirement. Then engineering comes way down below. You've got hydraulics down below. Then notes on canals and rivers. So these were all a set of books that they were published in the 1860s by this college. So they were becoming more relevant. So now you find technical books have started coming. Now early in the 1890s, you have this write-up in an American magazine about the College of Engineering Madras. And it says now they have a mechanical engineering degree, they have a civil engineering degree, and this is the picture of the campus. Today you cannot get this picture for the simple reason that buildings have come all around it. You, this view is impossible to find of the Civil Engineering College as it existed in Kalas Mahal in, uh, in, uh, in Triplicane and in Chepok. So this was the way that the students were, the teachers were and the college was. Gradually you find Indians are gaining, employ gaining admission into this in the subordinate and then the senior subordinate, finally in the engineering course. So by early 1900, you find Indians are also getting admitted into the... You can see over here, 1906, February 13, 1906, Maharaja Raja Sri, K.V. Shankara Iyer, a past engineer student of the Madras Engineering College, is appointed apprentice engineer, posted to the public workshops Madras. So this is how gradually Indians were entering the engineering service and they were gaining admission into public works department. So this was the first big employer, public works department. The next big employer was the railway workshops. 1857, you know, the 1856, the first Madras railway had come, Perambur railway workshops had begun, then Golden Rock workshops in Trichy, then slowly companies like Bini, companies like Parry, these were all the employers where people were getting employment from here and they were slowly getting placed in these, in these organizations. In 1911, you had a professor of engineering called Sir Alfred Chatterton in the College of Engineering, and he was asked by the government of Madras to start a department of industries. This was the first time that any government in India had started a department of industries. And they handpicked this gentleman from the College of Engineering. He was professor of engineering here. They made him head of the Department of Industries. They were hoping that he will promote British businesses. This Chatterton, very different kind of a fellow. He was very influenced by the Swadeshi movement. So he said, what is wrong with Indians starting industry? For a country to be good, you have to have Indians who should also start businesses of their own. They should become entrepreneurs. All this munshi, clerk, babu and all is fine, but they have to learn how to think, they have to start businesses of their own. Now the British businesses here were so upset with him that they lobbied with the government and closed the Department of Industry. So Chatterton came back to the College of Engineering. But Indians by that time were also members of the Central Legislative Council in Calcutta. So they began to lobby there saying that the Madras Department of Industries has closed. So the government finally ordered that the Department of Industries has to open. Chatterton once again made the head of the Department of Industries. Chatterton now had been thinking for some time, right? So two years he had, so he came back and he said, the Indians will never start a business by themselves. The government must start the business. Let us run it for two years, then sell it to the highest Indian bidder, whoever comes. So make pencils. The first thing to start is pencils. Madras Pencil Factory in Tandayarpete. Bring wood from East Africa, 
bring graphite from Andhra, make the lead, make the pencil. Two years they ran the Madras pencil factory very successfully. Then they auctioned it. We, Perumal, Chetty and sons bought the pencil factory. All of us, I am sure, not you children over there, you are all computer, cell phone, iPad generation, but us children in the first few rows, we all grew up on Perumal, Chetty and sons pencils. Then Chatterton said, Madras is a center for leather making. He initiated the chrome method of leather tanning and curing. That time there was a man called G.A. Chambers in Madras. He took that technology and started an area called Chrome Pet, where we have the Chrome Leather Company because of Chatterton. Then Chatterton said, aluminium is a good thing to make vessels out of. Why should Indians have only brass vessels, bronze vessels, silver vessels, gold vessels? Use aluminium, very cheap. Again, nobody coming forward. He started Indian Aluminium Company, Indal. And then it was shareholding, public shareholding was invited. All this was because of a professor of engineering in this college. Let's not forget that this man had, you know, so many great things was done by just one individual called Sir Alfred Chatterton. Now, I come to a very personal story. My grandfather, V. Ramaya, was a graduate from the College of Engineering also. In 1917 and uh, 1917, his father was a school teacher in Tirnalveli in a village and he had a monthly salary of 40 rupees. And there were eight children. Practically no money. Grandfather sat outside the school in which his father was teaching because there was no money to pay the fee, learned that way, finally on a scholarship entered that school, then wrote the whatever you call it in those days, the intermediate or the FA examination or whatever, gained admission into the College of Engineering at Kalas Mahal, which is where he studied in Triplicane, and for four years completed his civil engineering. When he completed his civil engineering degree, he stood first. And this is his gold medal. It is still with me, made of gold. And this is the slide rule that was given to him. I can't even carry it. And I don't know how to use a slide rule. I asked Shankar, I asked Gopal, and they said, we don't know how to use it either. So this is the slide rule that was gifted to my grandfather. And it says over here, V. Ramaya, engineer class 1917, prize for mathematics. This was the slide rule. So grandfather then joined the railways. He became a bridge engineer and later, that is the close-up of it where it says V. Ramaya, engineer class 1917 and then you have his ident this is his gold medal, the Divinton gold medal awarded by the College of Engineering Madras to V. Ramaya, hydraulic engineering in 1917. And then he joined the South Indian Railway Company in Trichy. He became a bridge engineer. He was involved with the restoration of the Palmban Bridge, very importantly, that was one of his big projects. Finally, he became the first Indian to become the chief engineer of the South Indian Railway Company. And this is the difference that an engineering college can do to an entire family. And it is not just one family, it was brothers, Brothers' children, sisters' children, cousins, everybody funded on the munificence of one man who becomes a graduate from this college, goes out, rises to the very top of his profession. Then he passed away, in, uh, he retired in 1951. Then he, you know, he became a completely different man. He spent his whole life on Vedanta and Sanskrit and all that. And he passed away in 1973. Years later, when, you know, his engineering degree was eaten up by white ants, and I felt so bad that the man who had lit a lamp in our lives, you know, he, we had lost his engineering degree. But these two became very precious possessions of mine. And wherever my father got transferred, these two I would take with me as a student so that I, they wouldn't get lost. And finally, they are still with me and I show it to my children. After that, none of us became a gold medalist, sadly. That's a different matter. But the point is, our future was made because of one man. And that is because of this particular college. So we are eternally beholden to what, and can you imagine how many families would have benefited like this? It's just one V. Ramaya I'm talking about. You can imagine every year people coming out and how many batches, how many families would have been uplifted the way it happened to us. And so we 
look at it now, so the railways were the employers, the PWD was the employer, and so on. Things, times were, however, changing. So in 1920, the Consul General of the United States of America in Madras, Jose de Olivares, is writing a note back to the government in the United States of America, where he's saying the government of India has sanctioned the construction of a new engineering college at Gindi, a suburb adjoining the city of Madras, which is estimated to cost $486,000. And it is anticipated that during the current year, a preliminary expenditure of 28,550 will be made on this work. The college, when completed, will be equipped and conducted on the most modern principles and will afford ample facilities and scope for technological instru instruction in all engineering and mechanical branches. At Saidapet, then it goes on to describe the agricultural college. But this is the first note that I could find. This is dated 1916 about how the land has been transferred, the construction of the building has really started by this time. So we'll go ahead. And thereafter, you have this beautiful piece of architecture, stunningly beautiful, eye-catching. Whether you're on a flight, whether you're on a road, you can't miss the College of Engineering, Gindi, and that dome, and the way it is structured. So the, for long, I didn't know who the architect was, and then I read this book written by your alumni of 1966. They give the name as W.H. James, and I didn't know who W.H. James was. Then I realized he was the successor to Love as the principal of the college. So he was the man who really designed the whole building. Sadly, he didn't retire in glory. Uh, there was a Deepavali celebration by the students, and they had lit lamps, and he came and kicked the lamps away. And then there was a complaint made against him and he was summarily terminated after this building was uh, constructed. But just to take you through a little bit, in the 1920s when this building was going to, when this building was planned, the big architectural project in probably the whole world at that time was the construction of New Delhi. Rashtrapati Bhavan, Rajpath, Janpath, the Kingsway, Queensway, the houses of legislature, all the palaces of the Maharajas that would be surrounding it, the houses of the colonial servants. You can see this is completely inspired by Latians and Baker. And they, the way they were constructing New Delhi, a lot of those architectural elements are copied in this particular building. We have a lot more photographs. This is the front view. Then I'm, of course, bringing, taking coals to Newcastle. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, but I couldn't resist it myself because it's so beautiful from all angles. Next, next, next. And you can see the Madras roofing style at that point of time. Even today, you don't need artificial ventilation despite all the heat that gets built up with buildings of this kind. It's a real wonder. And of course, the transportation engineering building, which is just next door. The reason why I bring this up is, in the, sometime in the 1920s, you have the automobile revolution coming to Madras. You have the first companies that begin to retail and sell cars and buses. Simpson and Company, Addison and Company, um, Spencer's, Gordon Woodruff, George Oaks, then Rane, UCAL, Union Company Accessories Limited, run by Indians. And these are all companies that are India Garage that are beginning to sell vehicles. So you need engineers who will take care of vehicle maintenance, who will, need, who will head technical workshops. So you find the transportation engineering has suddenly made an appearance in the college by that time. Later, in the 1950s, when the Indian government begins a highways uh, project of connecting all the state capitals with roads, you find a highways engineering department also coming up over here, which of course closes shortly thereafter. Again, the view from the dean's office straight as an arrow going all the way to the gate. Next, please. In once our friend James is summarily dismissed, you have the first Indian coming over, Nagaratna Mayer, who was also a alumnus of this particular college. And then thereafter, we have a series of Indians who take over. So the college is, even during colonial times, the college is becoming Indianized. So you find more and more Indians are getting into the college as students. The teachers are also Indians. 
So from the time that they said natives are useless and they cannot run anything by themselves, you find everything has changed. We, you know, we, we were teaching them a few things of how we were capable, we were managing things on our own. And I was, you know, very touched by the simplicity of what was there initially. The initial housing, I think the teachers require a great round of applause for the simplicity with which they came in, the faith with which they came in to lead lives. You know, they had a teacher's club which was a canvas tent for a very long period of time. And, you know, they had these very simple buildings which were residential accommodation. Of course, from my time till even in the 1980s, I remember the College of Engineering Gindi used to have a set of workshops. College of Engineering Delhi used to have a set of workshops that were exactly like this. And we were subjected to the most tortuous uh, practices over there of things that we were not used to, but we managed quite well. So all these buildings going back to a very, very early vintage, the other great thing about this is, in those days when they planned, they planned with a lot of sense of space and openness. They believed that educational institutions had to have wide open spaces. Perhaps they believed that it opened our minds. And it, you know, the sports facilities, just amazing. And you know, you've got Venkat Raghavan, you've had Krishnamachari, Srikant and others, and several others who came from this institution. But the sports facilities are something absolutely wonderful. Now, Indians were becoming bigger and bigger. Slowly, you had the story of V. Ramaya. You have the story of A.V. Ramalingayar, who became the first Indian to become the chief engineer of the PWD in the Madras presidency, an alumnus of this particular college. And three rivers, even today, bear his imprint. The first is the Mullai Periyar, the second is the Kaveri and the third is the Vaigai. All three dams were constructed under his direction. And uh, he actually worked with Penny Quick in the Mullai Periyar. Then he signed the Kaveri Waters Accord and he also constructed the Vaigai Dam. And the very interesting thing is, you can imagine how poor knowledge was that when the Vaigai Dam was constructed, those who were in the upper reaches of the Vaigai, that is before the dam, they took those who were in the lower reaches of Vaigai to court, saying that they are consuming all the water and we are not getting enough water up in the, up the river, on the hill. So they had to call Ramalingayar to come and give evidence saying that that judgment was finally accepted. So you can imagine how hydraulic engineering itself was in such infancy at that point of time. In 1940, you have the first set of women. So, Shanta Mohan has got a blog. I got this information from her. Is she here? Yeah. Madam, stand up, please. I wanted to acknowledge. Fantastic, fantastic. I didn't know that I will get to see you. In the last two months, I have gone to that blog repeatedly to read. And I loved your series where you've tried to trace the women from that Urvashi who studied in the Pune Engineering College and then you have taken on the story of the lady who is in the third, the A. Lalita. A. Lalita was a widow. Her father, Papu Subarao, was a professor in this college. And Lalita was a widow with a child. The husband had passed away, she was still young. Papu Subarao then approached Pr Pr Professor Chako, who was the, was it Professor Paul or Professor Chako? Professor Chako. And finally, she was given admission over here and she joined the electrical engineering syllabus because that was considered to be easier on women. So, for the first time, I also discovered there was a third lady. See, all the history talks about A. Lalita and then it talks about Leela George. It doesn't talk about P. K. Teresamma. Now, the first time only from uh, Shanta Mohan's blog that I was able to discover that there were three women in that particular batch in 1940 who joined. And Lalita's life is a story of great inspiration. So, having completed her engineering over here, she gets placed, uh, she initially is not placed, so she helps her father with certain projects. And, you know, there's no money because the father is after all only a teacher in this college, so she's not going to get anything extra. Finally, she gets placed in a firm in Calcutta, which is representing an, Eng an English engineering firm. 
And so she starts off in their technical side and then goes on to become more of a marketing person because she is then talking about their products at various projects. She becomes a spokesperson of sorts. And then in the 1950s, when there is the first convention of women engineers in Switzerland, she goes and acts as a representative. She's there. And she makes a speech saying that 100 years ago, if I, had, I would have been burnt along with my husband. Now I am here standing as an engineer. And she then travels to England where she goes to the parent company, works in Calcutta, finally retires, and then dies very soon after retirement, sadly because of an aneurysm. But that particular life was very, very impressive and I would not have got to know all this without Shanta Mohan's blog. Great madam, great work. Mr. Mutaya would have been so happy to have met you. Sadly, he's not here any longer. Yeah, next. Now, independence is arriving and just around the term time of independence, we have Indians investing in engineering itself. So, Raja Sir Annamalai Chetiar in 1946 starts the Annamalai University's engineering uh, college. Similarly, you have one other college coming up in Coimbatore. Immediately after independence, you have KVAL RM Aragapa Chetiar starting what is called the University College of Technology, which later becomes the Aragapa Chetiar College of Technology, which is just your neighbor. And then we also have C. Rajam starting the Madras Institute of Technology. Stories of great personal sacrifice, each of these men driven by vision and passion willing to sell their houses, willing to get rid of their businesses in order to ensure that education is provided for people whom they did not even know. So, K.V. Aragapa Chetiar was actually dying and he had sold everything in order to ensure that his institutions would carry on. C. Rajam sold his house on Radha Krishnan Salai in order to start MIT and that is how these institutions really began. And then, in 1958, you get this news item which says, Higher Institute of Technology, land assigned in Gindi. This is the IIT Madras. And just see the reason given down below, that why has this been given? 407 acres of land in Gindi from the Raj Bhavan, etc., etc., etc. Then it says, it will be recalled that the coordinating committee of the All India Council for Technical Education had recommended that the Southern Higher Technological Institute be located in the city of Madras. And in order to be of prompt assistance to the government of India, the Madras government has offered free of cost a suitable site in Gindi where the government college of engineering with a tradition of over 100 years, that this college is already there. And then the University College of Technology with its advanced studies in chemical engineering and textile technology and the Central Leather Research Institute are already located. So if an IIT comes here, it's only because of the College of Engineering, Gindi, already being here. It provided that infrastructure, without which none of this would have been possible. And then, of course, you know, a series of wonderful 1950s and 60s constructions in this campus. My love for heritage buildings always takes a greater priority. Sometimes you have these hostels, and then the chemistry block, sorry, not the hostel, the central workshop, which is so inspired by Russian, uh, you know, architecture, communist architecture of Russia, the <laughs> central, and even that man standing there against the wheel holding up the tools is so communist in the way it is, uh, it's been designed. And of course, in 1971, when they build a parallel block, such sensitivity to architecture that you can't make out that the old block in front is built in the 1920s, the block at the black is built in 1971. 51 years later, such sensitivity in design. Of course, they destroy that E. The E for engineering, which was the pattern of the old building, is destroyed by the other building coming up behind it. But, you know, you have to account for progress. These things will happen. And then the alumni. So the first time I read about an alumni is 1903, when I read two students came and attended an old boys meeting. Now after that what happened I don't know, but then suddenly you find in the 1940s and 50s the alumni slowly begin to give back to the institution. And you find buildings like this, the Hall of Gaines, 1968, then you've got the Gind engineers or whatever of 66, and so on. So gradually, the, the alumni coming back to contribute to the college. Now, in the midst of all this, the college syllabuses are not silent. So you've had the civil, you've had the mechanical, you've had the electrical. 
You find in the 1950s, as I said, the highway engineering came. Then you also find telecommunication engineering. This was the precursor to the electronics. And they were all getting employed in All India Radio, Doordarshan, uh, and other such organizations which were dealing with telecommunications. So therefore, you find that the syllabus has once again taken a change and is now reflecting what is really required in the 1950s and 60s. The, and look at this one. This again, classic Le Corbusier in, inspired, uh, it's like something out of Chandigarh, where you find buildings exactly of this kind, the Vivekananda Auditorium. So once again, I look back at the arts contribution of the college and I find that the first plays were staged in the 1940s. Lalita herself has spoken in an article about how for the first time they had women acting as women on the stage in the College of Engineering India. Otherwise, it was men acting as women. And from then on, the, I believe this arts wing was located in the hall of geodesy, which is in the main building. Then it becomes part of where the state bank counter is today. And finally, it moves into this wonderful auditorium where I myself have come for so many events in the past. So, it's a beautiful example of how very non-invasive but modern architectural styles also being part of a very historic campus. And then, of course, the sports center, which is a totally modern structure. In the midst of all this, we must not forget Professor K.S. Hegde. Absolutely, your principal. And uh, Professor Hegde, who was not just College of Engineering Gindi, he would leave his impress on Mysore, he would then come back, leave his impress on the MIT, a great educationist. And I had the privilege of meeting this old man uh, in the 1990s, just shortly before he passed away. A couple of years, he and I were members of the same Rotary Club and he would make an occasional appearance and I got to know about his greatness, but he would not talk much about it, you know. He was a man of very few words. He would let others talk about him, but he wouldn't uh, say anything. But I think lots of students carried forward his legacy. He was here for five years. But that was enough for an entire generation to be uh, inspired. And after that, you've had any number of other great principals and deans and all that, of whom I don't really need to mention. Just coming towards the end of the presentation. So, you know, then you had electronics and communication, and then you've had automobile. You've, then you find that this was, incidentally, this was the first college in India to start the telecommunication engineering uh, uh, section. And then when they begin the printing technology in 1983, they claim that they were really the first once again, of which I don't know whether that's an entirely accurate statement, but they say that they were the first. I'm sure none of this would have happened without the influence of the alumni coming back and giving feedback about what changes was coming across in this whole world and what, what else was happening. Next slide, please. In the midst of all that, we have somebody like Dana Berg, a philanthropist from abroad coming here and ensuring that a building on ocean technology and uh, the environment friendly sciences would get a completely modern structure being built in this in the midst of this wonderful campus so the college in my opinion is just not struck in time it has changed over the years of course in 1978 it becomes part of what is called anna university and ever since then in my opinion People talk about Anna University, but they don't realize that the College of Engineering Gindi is a center of excellence within Anna University. It's not as though this is Anna University by itself. This is a college of excellence, a center of excellence, which is within the university. So there is a big difference in when you uh, look at it uh, that way. So the institution itself, in my opinion, I come to the last, last, really last slide, where Remember, in the 1980s, you had what was called the Noon Meal Scheme, which M.G. Ramachandran uh, brought about. And uh, in my opinion, that was the greatest game changer possible, though at that point of time, everybody mocked him for what he was suggesting. But this was a man who had known poverty. And so he brought in what was called the Noon Meal Scheme, and that brought an entire generation of students into education. So Tamil Nadu really transformed itself into a center where people were educated. You had a large literary base. The other, of course, became the privatization of the engineering colleges, and that ensured that there were many p colleges available for 
admission. So, you know, one college or two colleges or five will never be able to do what 100 or 400 institutes. The quality of education may vary. But there is a fundamental basis from which those who are capable and those who are willing to apply themselves can rise to greater heights provided that education is given to them. That starts from the College of Engineering, Gindi, in my opinion. And in 1992, when India liberalized and people, the foreign companies were wanting to invest here, who were the first people to come? Ford came and then Hyundai came thereafter. They came because there was a trade body, there is still a trade body here called the Madras Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It's the second oldest chamber in the whole country, started in 1836. And the business leaders who were then leading the Madras Chamber, they presented a paper to the chief minister. Uh, at that time, it was Jaya Lalitha. And they said that the state is not doing enough to invite foreign investment and the investments may go somewhere else. Much later, in 2008, I had the privilege of going through that document. And it says very clearly, it lists the College of Engineering, Gindi as one of the talent pools available in this region which can transform this particular area into an industrial hub. It was a wake-up call. The government then went out and welcomed Hyundai and, uh, you know, Ford later, uh, Ford and Hyundai in that order. The engineering pool from all over the state, including the College of Engineering, really is what gave them that strength to come here. And today, Chennai makes three cars every minute and one heavy vehicle every 90 seconds. It also supplies 33 and one third percent of the automobile components made in the entire country. I don't think this would have been possible had it not been for a technical base that existed. And the base for that base is this College of Engineering, Gindi. Thank you very much for your time.